Moses' tabernacle, Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, and even Ezekiel's future third temple. Do you see what all of these have in common? It is a simple but profound universal message that has been communicated throughout the Bible. Welcome to the Temple Mount, or Har Habit in Hebrew. After 27 reviews from my amazing trip to Israel in March of 2023, we have come to the last location for me to review. In covering this site, you will notice many of the previous reviews will tie into this final review. The Temple Mount has played a massive role in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim history, and will play a significant role in the future. With so much to dive into, this final review will be the longest one I have ever released. So before I get into the biblical history and the future of this holy site, let me briefly show you around. To enter the Temple Mount, you have to go through a security checkpoint, and non-Muslims are not allowed to bring Bibles, wear religious clothing, or jewelry, and are not allowed to pray openly while on the Temple Mount. Why? Because even though we are in Israel, the Temple Mount is administered by the country of Jordan. In 1967, nearly 20 years after Israel became a nation again, Israel fought in the Six-Day War and defeated Jordan, Egypt, and Syria. Israel took over the Temple Mount complex for a brief time, but relinquished control back to Jordan to keep the peace. If Israel had not done this, it most likely would have resulted in the beginning of World War III. So Israel is in charge of the security of the Temple Mount, but the Islamic Waqf, appointed by Jordan, is in charge of the religious sites on the Temple Mount. After going through the security checkpoint, you enter this historic site by walking up this covered ramp called the Murabi Bridge. And while walking up this ramp, you get a great view of the Western Wall. Once on top of the Temple Mount, one thing you may notice is how beautiful the trees and the greenery is. But keep in mind, during the time of Jesus, most likely none of this vegetation was here, due to the Temple Mount needing to accommodate millions of Jews during their religious festivals. This is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and was built around 700 AD. It sits on the southern part of the Temple Mount, which is where part of the Royal Stoa was located during the time of the New Testament. Built in the late 600s AD, here is the Dome of the Rock. Indeed, it is the most recognizable building when seeing pictures of the old city of Jerusalem. Inside this famous structure is the foundation stone, which is part of the exposed mount. This is the traditional site where the Jews believe Abraham offered up Isaac, and they believe this is the exact spot creation happened on earth. It's also believed by many Bible scholars to be where the Ark of the Covenant was located in the Holy of Holies of the Jewish Temple, meaning this is where the presence of God was in the Old Testament temple periods. The Muslims believe this is the spot Muhammad ascended to heaven temporarily when he had his night journey. This is the backside of the sealed eastern gate. I did attempt to go down these steps, but I was told not to by a man presumably from the Islamic security watching the area. It was sealed up in 1541 AD by Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. We will return here later in the video. Oh, and before I forget, the Temple Mount is also home to a ton of cats. Now, let's break open the Bible and see what took place here. The Temple Mount is located on Mount Moriah. As I mentioned earlier, Jewish tradition says this is the place where creation began, where God formed Adam, and the location Abraham offered up Isaac as a sacrifice to God. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Most of you know the story, but Abraham's faith was being tested by God, and he was stopped from killing his son. God provided a ram as a substitute for the sacrifice. Now, please allow me to jump in a small rabbit hole for a moment in regards to Abraham and Isaac. Notice God says to Abraham in Genesis 22 2, Go to the region of Moriah. On a mountain I will show you. I have a theory that places Abraham offering Isaac on Golgotha, not Mount Moriah. In my review of the Garden Tomb and the Holy Sepulchre, I go over the possible locations of Golgotha. If the place Jesus was crucified was at Golgotha, inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it would be located here in relation to Mount Moriah. If Jesus died near this Golgotha, known as Gordon's Calvary, it would be located here. All these locations are very close to each other. In the Old Testament, Jesus was foreshadowed many times, including with Abraham offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice, just like what God did in sending his son as a sacrifice for us. I could be totally wrong, 
but both happening on Golgotha makes sense to me. It's not a popular opinion, especially among non-Christians. Samaritan tradition believes that the Akeda, or the Binding of Isaac, happened on Mount Gerizim, which is 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Please understand, I mean no disrespect to anyone's traditions, but also, please understand, just because something is tradition doesn't make me automatically believe it without doing some critical thinking and biblical research first. At the end of the day, the location truly doesn't matter. I'm simply sharing my thoughts on it. Now, let's climb out of that rabbit hole. Fast forward over 400 years, and we have God direct Moses to build the tabernacle so God could dwell among his people. Then, have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. This wasn't a permanent structure, as it could be taken down and moved as Israel moved throughout the wilderness. What does this tabernacle have to do with the Temple Mount? The tabernacle was a precursor to the eventual temple that will be built. After the conquest of the Promised Land, the tabernacle was placed at Shiloh, which was about 20 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It stayed there for almost 400 years. If I am blessed to return for another visit to Israel, Shiloh is one of the top spots I would love to visit. Then we come to the time of King Solomon and the first temple being built. Then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. It was on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite, the place provided by David. Now, not to beat a dead horse, but if the temple was built over where Abraham offered up Isaac as a sacrifice, wouldn't the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, have mentioned it here? So Solomon built a permanent place where the people could worship God and where God could dwell with his people. A few hundred years later, the first temple was destroyed by Babylon around 586 BC. Nebuzaradan, commander of the Imperial Guard, an official of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. This occurred because the people of Judah continually kept disobeying God. It laid in ruins for about 70 years. Then, the temple was rebuilt by Zerubbabel. The temple was completed on the third day of the month Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. This is what is considered the second temple. About 500 years later, Herod the Great began renovating and expanding the second temple. Some say around 37 BC, others say it was closer to 25 to 20 BC. But it was not until after his death that the Temple Mount expansion was completed, which was around 63 AD. The temple we read about in the Gospels in the book of Acts was during Herod's grand renovation. Some of the highlights recorded in the Gospels and the book of Acts are Mary and Joseph have Jesus dedicated at the temple. At 12 years old, Jesus was found here talking to the religious leaders. When he was in Jerusalem, Jesus taught at the temple frequently. Jesus chased out the money changers and overturned their tables. When Jesus died on the cross... One of the many things that happened was the veil separating the Holy of Holies was torn in two. In the book of Acts, as he was entering the temple, Peter heals a lame beggar. And then later, Paul was seized in the temple and arrested. So as you can see, quite a bit of things took place here at the temple during the New Testament period. Then, just seven years after Herod's Temple Mount renovation was completed, Rome destroys the second temple in 70 A.D. This event was foretold by Jesus. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Around 130 AD, the Roman emperor Hadrian is believed to have built a temple dedicated to Jupiter where the Jewish temple once stood. Then about 560 years later, the Umayyads built the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount where the Jewish Temple once stood. And though control of the area switched hands a few times since then, Muslims have been in control of the Temple Mount the majority of the last 1,330 years. At the beginning of this review, I covered what is presently on the Temple Mount, and that is controlled by the Jordanian-appointed Islamic Waqf, as they are in charge of all religious venues on the site. But will it always be this way? In the book of Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 43, the prophet describes an enormous third temple that hasn't been built yet. 
Son of man, describe the temple to the people of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their sins. Let them consider its perfection. And if they are ashamed of all they have done, make known to them the design of the temple, its arrangement, its exits and entrances, its whole design, and all its regulations and laws. This is the law of the temple. All the surrounding area on top of the mountain will be most holy. Such is the law of the temple. Now again, this temple obviously hasn't been built yet, and it appears that a lot of what is being described in these last chapters of Ezekiel is at least occurring during the millennial reign of Christ. But when will this third temple be built? Will it be built before the Messiah returns or after the Messiah's return? The Old and New Testament both give us a clear idea. At one point, after the Antichrist reveals himself to the world, he will desecrate the temple. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Jesus referenced this passage from Daniel. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Even Paul writes, do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So based on these scriptures, there should be a third temple built prior to Jesus' return. Whether that's done prior to the seven-year tribulation or in the beginning of it, who knows. It is the last major prophetic thing to happen before the second coming. And due to the ongoing tensions in the Middle East, if the Jews tried to build their temple on the Temple Mount, it would definitely start World War III. So in my opinion, there would need to be some charming individual like the Antichrist to broker some sort of peace deal to allow the Jews to have their temple here on the Temple Mount. So what about the sealed eastern gate I mentioned earlier? This is the other future event I wanted to point out concerning the third temple that happens when Jesus returns and also most likely will take care of this sealed eastern gate. In Zechariah, the prophet writes, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. And a few verses later we read, On that day living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea, and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea. So this earthquake will not only be strong enough to split a mountain in two that sits directly in front of the eastern gate, it will also accompany this newly formed river that will originate not just from Jerusalem, but Ezekiel chapter 47 says this river originates from the new temple. The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. He said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. What an amazing moment it would be to be a witness to all of this. This river of life flowing from the temple will turn the salty Dead Sea into a sea of life. And with all of this information, it's easy to surmise that if the eastern gate is to be sealed when Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives, it will be sealed no more. In closing, what do I want you to take away from this video? I mean, we looked at Moses' tabernacle, Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, and even Ezekiel's future third temple. Do you see what all of these have in common? It is a simple but profound universal message that has been communicated throughout the Bible. God has always wanted to live amongst his creation and always has made an effort to have a deep relationship with us. That desire culminated with Jesus coming and dying for our sins to make a permanent way for us to have that relationship with the Holy Creator if we simply believe and accept him as Savior. And speaking of temples, the Apostle Paul says about those of us who are believers, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? From start to finish, the scriptures are so clear. God loves you, and he wants a relationship with you, which is only possible through his only begotten son, Jesus. This concludes my review of the Temple Mount, and so marks my final review of the sites I visited on my incredible first trip to Israel. If you've made it to this point of the video, I sincerely thank you. I know this has been a very long review, but with how important the Temple Mount has been throughout history and what will happen here in the future, 
there was just simply no way to provide a short, in-depth review. Even though this concludes my reviews of the main sites that I visited, this is not the end of my Israel videos. In my next video, I will share some miscellaneous moments from the trip, like finding a Mexican restaurant that made great churros, and how I ran, eh, mostly walked, the 10K portion of the Jerusalem Marathon. If you've been here with me through all 28 of my reviews, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And as always, God bless. Thank you.